hey guys so back with the view um i'll go like this that way you can see it even more um so a lot of you ask me how i do my assessment so to explain the process the thought process i'm going to use as an example something i did uh today is sunday uh yesterday i did an assessment friday saturday actually i did an assessment on on a, on a woman she's in her 30s tall 511 six foot tall very strong very good crossfitter but for the last few I'm guessing years, has been plagued with uh, bulging discs in her lower back. So I think she has seven millimeters on the L5, something like that, a few millimeters on the S1. I mean, so, well, so, you know, things are painful. Uh, whenever things flare up, she has to stay more than a few days on the couch, in bed, laying down. You, you guys, you know, uh, those stories and everything. And so she came to me to, to see if I could help because she, as usual, she goes to physiotherapy, they make her squeeze her glutes, do a few bridges, I'm sure, a little bit of hammies, and now what? Like the second she goes back to any form of intensity, things flare up again and everything. So uh, usual stuff after physiotherapy, now what? Not ready to go back to any kind of training. Right now she can only do body weight because the second she loads, things start hurting. So uh, that is... Fortunately, something I see quite often. I mean, she has the bulging disc is seven millimeters is not, you know, not, is not a, uh, a little, but still um, on that alone, like I have a lot of people that come to me and say I have bulging disc. And th that is something, of course, not to be ignored. But at the same time, you have to realize everybody has a bulging disc. Okay, about 90% of people either have a bulging disc or a crush disc. And I'm talking about people that do not have back pains. Okay, I'm sure if I were to do an MRI, I would find bulging this, maybe a crush one, uh, trust me, my spine would not be uh, intact. And yet I have absolutely no back pain. I can do crazy stuff with a yoke. I mean, I handle heavy weights and I've never had back pain. But I will do the MRI one day just to prove a point. But um, I'm sure there's a bulging disc somewhere. Not seven millimeters, don't get me wrong, but I'm sure there's something somewhere. So you have to be careful. Like if we go, again, if you do MRI and things like that, they're always going to find something. That does not necessarily mean that it's, it's not a good thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either in the sense of if you move correctly and the, you have muscles in the right places, that will not lead necessarily to pain. Like um, the point here also is uh, it becomes a crutch. Like you go see those physiotherapists and say, oh, you have a bulging disc and that becomes the reason why you have back pain. And that's it. You don't have to look any further than this. You have back pain because you have a bulging disc. And that's what scares me with, with that approach to things. It's, of course, nobody wants to have a bulging disc. But again, everybody has, so most people, sorry, 90% of people have bulging disc and everything. The, the correlation is not necessarily back pain, bulging disc. I mean, chances are you have back pain for something else. Or maybe you created the bulging disc from something and just trying to fix the bulging disc will not solve the problem. So be careful with those kind of things. I, I do not like that approach to movement uh, where, um, like for example, to, to use another example, like ankle, people come to me and have the ankle, the ankle collapsing in or, uh, you know, people staying on the outside of their feet. That's strong people do that a lot. Actually, they have a tendency to go toward the outside of their feet. Uh, uh, but same thing when people collapse inside uh, on the ankle and everything. And a lot of people try to fix the ankle in that sense. Like the problem is with the ankle, so we're gonna fix the ankle. And no, no, that's, that's not the problem because um, the, the question is always why? Why is the ankle doing this? Again, uh, you remember what I said before, the body is perfect. If, unless you mess it up, it would not do that. Unless, again, yes, some people will be found with extremely flat feet and everything, but I'm pretty sure if you were to move correctly, you would not have that issue, okay? So the problem when you just focus on where the problem ends up, in that case, the ankle, you would put the ankle back straight but you still have not fixed why everything is caving in or pushing out. So that means you're gonna put the torque. There's a reason why it's coming in, right? So the ankle wanna go that way is to lessen the, because you created torque this way. And so naturally there's inclination to cave in. If you have put my ankle, the ankle straight like this, all that pressure will still go on the ankle, making one it to collapse. And so by working on those ankle or mobility and things like that to make sure the ankle are straight, you have not fixed the problem right the torque is still there so now you, uh, you you're not even letting the body adapt to the torque you're changing 
the, uh, you're changing the breaking point, which is something in engineering, that means where all the stress goes, that's the breaking point. So the breaking point in that case is the ankle because it's the weakest joint. And so if you change that, that joint, the position of that joint, imagine the pressure you're going to put on it because you still haven't changed the torque. The torque is exactly the same as before. The only thing you have done now is putting the ankle in an even weaker position. So that's going to lead to bad things. You will not fix the ankle that way. I mean, you have to go back to the hips, see, see what, what is causing the torque. So always it's all about going backwards, trying to find that key log. And so to go back to the lower back, so now you have bulging discs. I'm like, okay, but that, that's, not, that's not a why, that's a what. Like you go to see a, uh, a doctor or a physiotherapist and basically you're coming and you see my back hurts. Okay, my lower back hurts. So they're going to do all a fancy test, an MRI, a spine, and they come back and they go, your back hurts. Uh, yes, you're right about that. Thank you. $3,000, you're welcome. Uh, so, okay, so you have bulging this, but that doesn't tell me the why. So be careful. Even like I go about, uh, about that, um, that Simon Sinek lecture about the, the why, the how, and the what. But it goes past just being able to get people to do, you know, to change behavior. It goes past this, is to change your own behavior also on how you look at problems. As a movement specialist, you, you cannot be stuck with the what. The guy comes with the lower back pain, you cannot be stuck like, you know what, I'm just going to make the lower back pain go away. And then to do that, I'm going to focus on the lower back. That is the wrong way of thinking. That's not how you have to look at it. If you do this, you will never go truly to the cause of the problem because 99% of the time, where you feel pain is not where the problem is. It's where the problem ends, but it's not where the problem starts. So if you do that, you're only going to take care of a recurrent problem. I mean, you're going to take care of a problem that's going to be recurrent. And so every six weeks, every six months, whatever, they're going to come back. And it's great for business because every six weeks, you're, the people come back and they're never better. They're better for a little bit, probably because you make them rest and stop doing what hurt them in the first place. And the second they go back to intensity, they get hurt again. So is that what we're trying to do? Not me, that's for sure. Like I refuse that idea to tell like, let's say, let's take that, that lady in, in her 30s, like, no, you're done. You're never gonna squat again. You're never gonna put weight. You're never gonna train hard. Just go die, basically. I, I just refuse that mentality. Like, so they, they go, yeah, you have bulging disc, stop doing what you're doing. I'm like, no, no, no. So my goal is to find exactly what happened in the first place, right? Not just, yes, I know she has lower back pain now. I, I get that part. She told me she has pain. She's not lying. I get that part. So now the question becomes, how do we find what happened? So I'm looking at her and then typical uh, assessment. So lower back pain, let's start with hinging. Let's see if you can hinge versus a squat, right? So I put her through the one left stiff leg deadlift. That's a video I might put out there. It's a very hard movement to coach. That's why I'm reluctant to do a video about it. But it's, it's a matter of seeing if the person can truly hinge. So it's a one leg stiff leg deadlift. And I'm going to see, I'm going to ask the person to hinge, not to squat and especially not to bend the spine. That's mostly what I see when I ask people to hinge in that case is instead of having the hip, you know, the hinge at the hip, they'll, they'll first squat down and then round their spine. So flex their spine and then extend flexion, extension, flexion, extension, using the erectors to go up. So they squat round their spine. And then after that, use their spine to go back up. So you've seen this, instead of hinging here, they, they squat down and then use their spine. And then once they're in that position, even if they squat first, all they're gonna do is this to go back up, right? Instead of hinging, they're gonna just get their, get their spine straight. So I see that problem a lot. And that's usually what people think is hinging. So, and then that, that, um, that means too much flexion of the erectors instead of using the glutes and the posterior chain in a better way is too much extension of the erector. So a lot of time, that's where the back pain comes from. And in that case, when they call it back pain, it's not, I mean, it's of course it's, it's pain, but it's a spasm. It's not really like they have back problems per se, is they have back spasm because the erectors is working so hard, usually one side versus the other, uh, is working so hard that it goes into spasm. And that's where their pain comes from. So that's why whenever they rest two, three weeks, they feel, oh my God, I feel so much better. Yeah, because you start spasming. And so, but you go back to exercise and at first it's okay. And now you're loading again too much erectors because you haven't changed the pattern, loading again, loading again. And then guess what? The spasm comes back. Go see the PT. And so now we have a problem because now you go see the PT and you say, my back hurts, right? So it's going to look, it's going to check and it's go, oh my God, your erectors, look at that. They swollen, there's this, there's that. So look, make you squeeze your glutes. And then after that, they're going to do treatment on the erectors or things like that. So what they're doing right now 
is they are making sure that your erectors are prime to go back to working the second you, you go back out there. So literally making the problem worse. Because instead of making sure the glutes and the hammies work correctly and lowering the stress on the erectors by learning to hinge, what they're doing is they're making everything recover correctly but without changing the pattern. So now the erectors are ready to do exactly what they did just before. So they're ready to, to work. So now every time you see the PT, you'll notice the, it comes shorter and shorter, shorter period of time before the pain comes back. Why? Because you made the erectors capable of doing more work now because you treated them, ultrasound, whatever it is that they do, massage, all that stuff. So erectors are like, hey, I'm ready to do again. So they go back even stronger than before. So now you use your erectors even more and even less the glutes. And so, of course, they get to spasm faster now, not slower. You know what I mean? So, and that's why you see people, it's every six months and every three months and every two months and every month and every, you know what I mean? And it goes like this. It's because every time you go there, they're making your erectors prime to do more work. So it actually making the problem worse. So how do you change that? You change that by teaching people how to hinge correctly. So I want less muscle, weirdly, on the erectors. I just, I don't want the erectors not as strong. I just, I want everybody, everything else stronger. So I have to make sure the erectors stop taking the entire load. And first things first, you have to teach people how to hinge. So to go back quickly to the assessment, I go, so I make that lady hinge, one leg deflect the lift, and surprise, she can hinge perfectly. I was like, wow, okay. That's different. That's usually where I see people. Ah, yeah, there's your problem. So hinge on the on the left leg, perfect. I was like, okay, let's see the right leg. Other surprise, you could hinge on the right leg also perfectly. I was like, okay, that's new because most people can squat, especially cross but they cannot hinge. So I was like, okay, that's very surprising. That's usually for back pain. I was very very surprised there. It's most people cannot hinge that well anyway, and especially with back pain. So I was like, okay. So then we get to. Uh, we get to test a few other things, uh, like the, um, the Jefferson. The Jefferson, she had a problem on the left because she had also a torn labrum, torn hip labrum on the left uh, that she never did a surgery on. She just let it heal and did rehab. I was like, okay, so first set, obviously this side, like the, the side that is torn, does not like the Jefferson because he put so much pressure on the groin. And, but by the second set, she was actually shaking, but doing the movement was better already. And so I was like, hmm, okay, so that's a bit strange. And so I get her now to do a sandbag squat. And oh boy. So she takes the 60 pound sandbag, does one rep, and starts bowling. Like right away, she had a very, very emotional reaction to it and started to feel the pinch on the left right away. I was like, okay, so it's a squat form and everything. So I'm like, okay, 60 pound sandbag, though, should not get that kind of reaction. So that means she's been in pain for a very long time. And uh, I talk about this in a, in a video before, like she has learned to feel more pain and to freak out even more on those kinds of things. So I was like, okay, it's okay, no, don't get hurt, please. Drop the sandbag, I've seen what I need to see. The second she started hinging, going into the squat, the back cramped and everything. But I was like, okay, so the first moment you tried to hinge, you were in pain. But yet when I made you hinge on a one leg stiff leg, you felt no pain. I was like, okay. That's a little bit of a, that's a little bit different. Let's put it this way. So uh, suddenly I was like, hmm, I wonder if it's the lower back because that doesn't really fit the profile. And so we w I went back to testing everything as you should always do. And then first things first, when she stands up, left shoulder goes like this. So think something I see, you know, a lot with crossfitters like this. You see, if you start to look at people, you'll see the second they get a little bit tired, here comes the left shoulder. Why? Because whenever the, there's a problem with the lats in CrossFit, I talk about all the time, and uh, usually on the weak side is even worse, right? Lack of work in the medium plane. Um, whenever the lats start to give, you have to go toward the trap. So the second you cannot keep the lats engaged to keep my shoulder in place, right? The second thing I'm going to do is go toward the second muscle group, which is the trap. So instead of staying strong here, I'm going to start doing this, right? I'm going to start shrugging. And so that's what you see people going like this. They're trying to save all this by going toward the trap. So that's usually an indication that the lats are not strong enough. So, and then he was pretty, pretty advanced. So I was like, okay, I make her do the landmine rose. It wasn't uh, that big. I mean, she could do it. She wasn't strong. So I could tell her lats needed to be stronger anyway, but he did not give her any back pain either. So she could do the movement. It was hard. It was too challenging for what it should have been considering the weight and how strong she is. So I was like, okay, so we go back. Uh, you don't have enough lats no matter what. But again, she was able to be in a perfect position without back pain. So I was like, okay, that's, I don't think the torque comes from your lower back. I know that's where he ended up, but I think that's where he started. And so we st I started to continue the assessment. 
But I started to think, hmm, I, the left and the right leg are fairly balanced, so are the glutes, so are the groin, even with the tear. I was like, they, they, you could tell like she was leaning more toward the, the, le the left leg, but that was fairly normal because of her background before CrossFit in athletics, where it was a lot of one-sided sports, that's very common. And so, yes, she was at a tendency to load more one leg versus the other, but the difference wasn't big enough to cause that kind of damage. I had uh, I have a lot of people, I load one hip a lot more than that. They have issues, but not that much. I mean, and so I was like, okay, so let's keep the assessment going. So far, outside of the squatting with a sandbag, I haven't seen anything that is that should cause that kind of damage on the body. And so, but the left lat is starting to show as really a deficiency versus the right lat. I've seen it before, nothing, uh, you know, something to work on, but no big deal. So we go, uh, that's on Friday, right? So we go on Saturday and Saturday we do my, uh, we do the strumming class because I needed to see how much the lat was a problem. So first we do the the rope pull and you can tell, of course, as expected, you know, able to reach on the right side, not able to reach on the left. So very long on the right, very short on the left, long, short, long, short. So obviously the leg, sorry, the left arm, the left lat uh, is not capable of working. So I was like, okay. Uh, and then I start to see like the deficiency was even more pronounced than I thought. I was like, okay, so now I'm not gonna make her carry overhead. So I was a little bit careful. I didn't want to put with a yoke with too much weight. So I put her through a simple 45 pound plate, right? And I make her walk in front of me, 45 pound plate overhead, arm straight and start walking. And that's where I saw the biggest difference. Like suddenly you can see the entire left side was atrophied. The right side was here because she has a wide back and the left side, nothing. I mean, and, but you could tell also the second the arms were overhead like this, the entire spine was shifting to the right, toward the right side that is so much more developed than the left. Like the, suddenly that jumped at me. Uh, I was kind of guessing that's where uh, this was happening because I could tell the problem was not with the lower body, it had to be the upper body. And the way how she was behaving, obviously the left lat was the biggest issue, but I kept the testing going. And suddenly the second she got overhead, it jumped at me how much of a difference between the left and the right. And so what happened is every time she was in this position, so here, or even the back squat, the difference between the left lat and the right lat did not allow her to have a squatting, a correct squatting motion. So she ended up doing this and completely torque like this because overhead or here it, for the T-spine, it's the same position, right? And so anything, in this position right here, created such a torque. So it, it was, she was so, uh, really so incapable of keeping her body balanced in that position, balanced as in, like, you know, in a straight, correct position in a Benjamin plane, that it created torque on her spine. And over years of volume and being so strong, she actually managed through this motion overhead on the snatch and everything, but especially probably on the squatting, hands here turning and everything, she managed to create enough torque on the lower back that she bulged this in the L5, L4 and S1. So um, at the end of the assessment, I told her, look, this is this. The problem is your back is ruined because of your left lat. This is how it started. You have such a deficiency in your left lat that you are incapable of doing any overhead movement, any snatch, any, any clean and everything, and especially any squats without turning, without torquing at the hips because they had to compensate for this uh, being in an incorrect position. And so the lack of, um, how do we call it? The lack of balance between the shoulders and the hip created the torque uh, around your disc and that's what gave you bulging discs. And so we, we came to it basically. That, so it's to tell you, first of all, so to tell you how important it is to balance your lats, by the way, but no matter what. So it was so easy to miss for everybody on that one because the second shell bulge in this, that's all they concentrated about. It's like, there's a problem with your glutes. There's a problem with your lower back and everything. And then of course we have to make the glutes better. But that's the first thing that when I saw overhead, I was like, that's the problem. And so at that stage, it's like, let's, let's make sure I'm right. So what did I do next? I make her drag the, the sled. She could go as hard as possible of course, in pain, but no pain in the lower back. And then more importantly, she went into the harness. The harness, the weight is gonna be here. It's gonna be in this position. Like if you can't activate your glutes, you're in trouble because then your hips are gonna shoot up. That would put pressure on the spine. She was able to do the harness 
no problem, no pain. Uh, I mean, no pain, pain from the harness, but no pain in her lower back, even though at first she was very, very um, afraid of hurting herself. She pushed through a full intense minute, gave me everything she got. You can imagine how she felt after, because she hasn't been able to train like that in a long time, but there was no pain in the back. So that told me, okay, if you can go left, right like that on a harness, a drag, the problem is not in your lower body. The problem was with the upper body. So the left flat, again, created such a problem for that balance between shoulder and hips that it created a torque on the, um, on the L5 and below and created the bulging discs. So that was so easy to miss, right? If you focus only on the athletes comes and say, I have a lower back problem and that's all you focus on. Okay, lower back, so we're gonna do the glutes, we're gonna do the hammies and everything. You would have missed the entire root of the problem. The root of the problem was with movement, not with the body part. There, were, there are different deficiencies for sure. But the problem is the deficiency in the left flat was such a problem, it changed all movements coming from the upper body. So any overhead squat, any snatch, any clean, any squat where the weight starts here created the problem. So remember the S pyramid, structure, stabilization, specialization. When they, she had lower back, what did they make her do? Glutes and everything, that specialization, that just the end of the movement. First, you have to look at the structure. And what is the structure on the squat? It's first, the weight is on the T-spine. Overhead, same problem. So in order to hold the T-spine together, you need traps, you need the lats, you need all that structure. So that's how I went through the assessment, is thinking always structure first. So if the structure of the hips was correct, then it wasn't that. Then that's not where the problem started. So then I went to the second structure whenever you do a squat, in that case, for the squat but like overall like after the hips I always look at the upper body and that's where it was so again so easy to miss so they all focused on the wrong thing the problem was not coming from the lower back the problem was coming from the left flat because the structure of the of, of any overhead movement was compromised and that's why it created the torque on the on the vertebrae and that's why people missed it for the last five years very easy to 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 um, to miss but the problem is it was the wrong way of looking at the human body. This isn't about, ooh, that muscle, ooh, fix that ankle, or whatever. It's about movement. If the movement creates the wrong kind of torque somewhere, the body will crack. I mean, don't fix the crack, fix the movement, okay? Why, how, what, okay? So don't, don't go after, ooh, my ankle is moving wrong, ooh, that shoulder is moving wrong. Fix the structure, the S pyramid. Fix movement, okay? Get after the S pyramid, fix the structure. Feed the, uh, fix the stabilization, then fix specialization, right? It's all about that S pyramid. And again, this is about fixing movement. This is who we are, movement specialists, right? So stop looking at things through a very small prism. Like again, going back to that painting, stop looking at a small part of the painting. Take a step back, look at the hole and see, okay, let's see what jumps at me. What is wrong movement wise? Was her hinging wrong? No. Squat, I couldn't tell she was in pain right away, but you could tell, so it was squatting motion that was causing her pain. Okay, but you can hinge. You have quads, they are actually strong, hammies, glutes. You can't hinge, but you can't squat, so not what the problem is. So you keep going like this. And so after the hinging, after the squatting, I go, well, okay, so let's see overhead. And overhead you go, there it is. That's where that jumps at you. I have, I have the picture. I don't want to show it because, uh, you, yeah, it's like when I show the that athlete that I will not name his picture, but he was like, <gasps> I know who that is. So not going there. But the difference between the left and the right was such a difference. And he just jumped and I'm like, there it is. I don't see a major problem everywhere else, but that is such a big problem that is so obvious that you're turning and everything. This is where it started. I mean, so don't look at, at small muscle group. That's not the point. Look at movement, look at structure. Take a step back, look at the entire painting. Don't look at small pieces, it doesn't work like that. That's what PTs do and everything. PTs are great when you get, when you have trauma, a traumatic injury, like you get hit, you get something pops and everything. So Western medicine is great for that. Good surgeon, good PT, now it's working. The problem is after that. After you go through the PT, that's where we need movement specialists because then us will, will come and we'll look at structure and we say, let's make you move correctly. Okay, let's fix movement. Let's stop to focus on, ooh, this is like that and everything. M look at movement. Can the person hinge correctly? Can the person squat correctly? Can the person put things overhead, press correctly? Those things are basic 
movement. It's a structure of the pyramid, and you always have to take care of those first. Okay? I will probably do a pyramid just based on those things, but the idea is the S pyramid, structure first, right? Make people move correctly in the basic movements. Make them squat correctly. And I'm not talking about all the same with the feet in front. Everybody squats differently. But the movement of squatting has to be correct. Okay? The movement of hinging has to be correct. Pressing has to be correct. Holding weights overhead without being turning one way or turning that way has to be correct. If you see someone that cannot hold a weight overhead without one shoulder going up, turning or anything, then fix that first. What are you going to fix anyway beside this? This is wrong. You're moving incorrectly on a basic movement. If they can't do that, then fix that first, okay? It's the S-pyramid structure first. Well, there is there to fix before you fix that anyway. If you can't hold correctly your weight overhead, why would I make you press? And oh my goodness, why would I make you snatch, right? So that's what we do. We fix basic movements. Do that first. Step back, take a look at the entire painting, okay? So that is how I looked at the assessment. Uh, I'm sure you got to have him. It's actually, once you see the problem, it's actually very simple, right? Like, once you go like, oh, that's where I started. So it's a, there's, a process, there's a mental process here that is different, where you have to shed a little bit of uh, wh what they teach you and just look at people for, just as human beings. I mean, th th there's, a, there's a mental process there that has to take place. But that is what the idea, that what goes through my mind when I do an assessment, really, is looking at, I just pull pattern movement. That's it, and I'll, see, I'll poke around I see what really strikes me, what really jumps out, and I'll go, hey, that's where it is. And then once I point it out, usually people go, hey, that's where it is. How come I didn't see that before? I'm like, yeah, I know. How come you didn't see it before? So a lot of time, it's fairly obvious. If you just look at the person, take a step back, just let them, let them squat, move, and everything, and you go, ooh, oof, that doesn't look good. Uh, that's a good indication. That's where you should start, okay? See you guys soon for the next one.